We're going to do a little bit of an interactive sermon today. So I've I've got a question for our little ladies in, in the front row here. What are we celebrating today? What are we celebrating today? St. Patrick's Day. You are absolutely right. How about you? Are we, are we celebrating something else? What are we celebrating? Sunday. Sunday, you're absolutely right. Yeah. We're celebrating Sunday in the, the, fifth, the fifth Sunday in Lent. So I get that now you know that there are prizes. Okay. So at, at 8 o'clock, I asked a question, and nobody wanted to speak up until somebody finally did speak up, and I gave them a prize, and then everybody, then everybody wanted to participate. So now you know there's prizes for, for getting the answers correctly here. You know that lately we've been talking a lot about culture. We've been talking about being mindful of our culture here at St. John's, and that, of course, means awareness of not only how we wish to be perceived, but how others perceive us in the world. And that's an important thing for us to pay attention to. Uh, we want to be mindful of how, uh, when, when somebody comes in those doors for the first time, we want to be mindful of, of what that experience might be like. And we want to be mindful of what our social media presence appears to be and what our website appears to portray. Because uh, people look to the culture when they're seeking a spiritual home. I think here, uh, It's safe to say that we strive to make sure that our culture is one that is welcoming and affirming and loving. And we want to welcome everyone in our doors. And so, by the way, if you happen to be a visitor here with us this morning, please know that you are welcome here. And you are welcome as you are. And you are welcome for who you are. And you are welcome for wherever you happen to be at this stage in your life. And of course, you're invited to join us officially if and when you're ready. But in the meantime, you're welcome to simply be here. And we we love you for who you are. And we're glad that you are here. Now, if you've been to different Episcopal churches, Episcopal parishes, you'll know that each parish is a little bit different. Parishes don't all have the same identity. They don't all have the same culture. Some of the things that we do here at St. John's simply wouldn't work if we tried them at a different parish because it doesn't match the culture. Now, I think one of the things that we try to keep in mind here at St. John's when we, when we try new things or we do things during worship is we remember that a major component of our culture is joy. And we want to make sure that that joy is communicated in everything that we do. Every way that we worship, everything that we do when we gather together, we want to make sure that joy is a component of that culture here at St. John's. And when we talk about culture, we're not just talking about uh, here on the local level. Because certainly we do things here at St. John's uh, that are within our own culture. But our culture is also influenced by other, uh, other resources, right? The, the Episcopal Diocese of Arizona informs a piece of our culture and our identity. And the Episcopal Church informs our culture here at St. John's and in the diocese. Because local cultures can be malleable and moldable to fit the, the local flavor, if you will. But not for everything. Because some things we have to do the way the Diocese of Arizona tells us. And some things we have to do the way the Episcopal Church tells us. Some things are just non-negotiable. Okay? So first thing I want to do is I want to ask the question. When we, hear, when we talk of the Episcopal Church, we hear two, two words. We hear Episcopal And we hear Episcopalian. Can somebody tell me the difference between the word Episcopal and the word Episcopalian? I see see a hand. I see a hand. Well, Episcopal does mean bishop. That that that, you know that that deserves a that deserves a prize. That that so 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 a prize for someone else. (laughs) 
Whoops, I, di I didn't reach. Here, there we go. Uh, there's uh, 10,000 10, fish. Okay, so Episcopal comes from the Greek word episkopos, which means bishop. That is absolutely correct. How about the difference between, between Episcopal and Episcopalian? Episcopal is an adjective. Episcopalian is a noun. So this is the Episcopal Church, which, by the way, is an Episcopal Church. As we just heard, Episcopal means governed by bishops. So all churches that are governed by bishops are Episcopal churches. The Roman Catholic Church is an Episcopal Church. The Greek Orthodox Church is an Episcopal Church. Any church that is governed by bishops is an Episcopal Church. We are the Episcopal Church because our original name years and years ago was the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States of America. Okay, that informs our culture. Right? We are a church that is governed by bishops. But that word Protestant was dropped uh, from most communications, uh, not everything. If you look in your prayer book there, it does say Protestant Episcopal Church. But that word Protestant was dropped because it doesn't really mean what Protestant means. It, when, it was, when it was put into print, Protestant was simply a, a word that in American Christianity meant Christians who were not in communion with Rome. But Protestant theology is, is a little more nuanced than that. And Protestant theology uh, protests the Roman practices, which is why it's Protestant. It's a protest. And in Anglicanism, we're not exactly protesting anything. So uh, the name didn't quite fit very well to say Protestant. So now we just, use, uh, we just use the Episcopal Church. Now, the Reformers, the Protestant Reformers, and their theology influences our theology as Anglicans, uh, but also our, uh, our Catholic background influences us. So when we talk about the Episcopal Church, I've heard people use the term via media. Via media. What does via media mean? That's a Latin term. What does it mean in English? I, I, heard, I heard way over there. You, you ready? M middle way. Middle way. You ready? Can I, can I reach, you think? Oh, one, one shy. One shy. Here we go. Another one. Oh! oh. <laughs> Now, now I owe Frank a, a couple candies. <laughs> here, I'm going to come down here for this one. I don't want to. I, I don't want to take anybody's eye out. There you go. There we go. Uh, the via media means middle way. It's Latin for middle way. And uh, in the Episcopal Church, we like to think of ourselves as a middle way uh, between Catholicism and Protestantism. Okay. So, what does that look like to us? That looks like. Uh, celebrating the historical liturgies of the church, right? And maintaining things that are important in the historicity of Christianity. So things like uh, ordaining uh, priests and deacons and bishops, right? That's something that is important to us as Episcopalians. And we have something called the apostolic succession of the bishops, which means that in theory, all of our bishops have been ordained by bishops who had had hands laid upon them dating all the way back to the times of the apostles. That's what apostolic succession means. And we value that. Right? We value that. But we also value uh, some other things like worship in the vernacular of the people. That was something that was uh, very important during the English Reformation because we decided, well, we don't speak Latin. So why are we worshiping in Latin? We speak English. We should worship in, in English, which is the language we speak, which will help us to become closer to God. So worship in our vernacular, in the language that we speak, is part of that, uh, that via media. Okay? And we also celebrate the sacraments. Okay? Now, how many sacraments are there? I, I, heard, I heard seven here. I'm not, I'm not so good at this game. Here, here you go. There we go. Okay, seven sacraments, okay. And how many sacraments of those seven are the sacraments of the gospel? Who said two? Who said two? You, you said two? 
Okay, and an extra, extra prize if you say what they are. What are the two sacraments of the gospel? Baptism and Eucharist. Baptism and Eucharist. Extra, extra prizes, extra prizes. <laughs> Baptism and Eucharist. Okay. And what about the other five? What, what are the other five sacraments? Who, who said marriage? Marriage? Confession, Confession reconciliation? Baptism. Well, we, we already said baptism. Ordination. Yes. Ordination. Holy orders? Not, not, not death, no. <laughs> Confirmation. <laughs> Ex no, that's not one of them. Uh, unction, unction. Last rites. Unction, it's called unction. The sacrament of the sick is called unction. Okay. Now, in the Episcopal Church, this is part of our Via Media, is the first two sacraments are the sacraments of the gospel, Baptism and Eucharist, and the other five are listed as other sacramental rites. Now that is very Anglican, that is very via media, because Protestant denominations say that there are two sacraments, baptism and Eucharist. And we say there are two sacraments of the gospel, so that we can align with people who believe there are two sacraments. Right? But we also say these other five rites are important rites, and they have sacramental nature to them. And so, so we get to decide for ourselves whether we consider them to be sacraments or not. Right? So that's that, you see where the, the via media comes in, that middle way is there's room for someone who has that theology that says these seven are the sacraments. And there's also room for someone who says that only these two are the sacraments and these other rites and rituals are, are, are important rituals as well. Okay. Now we don't, in Anglicanism, we don't focus on the, the finer details. Okay? For instance, our Eucharistic theology talks about something called real presence. We don't have uh, something called transubstantiation or consubstantiation, although there are plenty of Anglicans who believe in what those terms mean in their respective churches. Instead, we talk about real presence, which means that Jesus is present in the sacrament, and we don't try to split hairs to figure out how that happens. Right? He's with us in a meaningful way. So, so if that means that uh, you want to have a, 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 an idea that, that transubstantiation is, is what happens, then, then you are 100% uh, perfectly okay to have that belief. And if you believe that it's more of a memorial, well, the same, same goes for you. You get to decide. Because what we do together is we don't necessarily always share the same beliefs, but we say the same words. Okay? And we share words that are what you might call common. Now... When I say the word common, what does that remind us of in Episcopal worship? What is, what is it? Well, you got you know, com, the Book of Common Prayer. The Book of Common Prayer is a book that has exactly that in it. Common prayer, common words that we say together. So when we say those words together, as Episcopalians, which is, of course, a noun, right? As, when we say those words together, we say the same words, but we don't have to mean them the same way. Right? Maybe you are at a, uh, a, a better place spiritually than I am, and we're praying together. And so maybe you are able to go deeper with the understanding of the words that you are saying than I am. Right? But we still say those words together, even though your understanding might be much more uh, deep th than mine. And that's okay. That's what, that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to, to be uh, something that we can all say together together. Right? Because being together in community is important. So it's focused on, on the common prayer. Right? We don't always have to mean the same things, but we say the same things. And our prayer book is made up of a lot of verses that come right out of the scriptures. A lot of people say, oh, those Episcopalians, they, they value their book of common prayer more than they value the scriptures. But that's not true, because our book of common prayer has a whole lot of scripture in it. Does anyone have any idea how much of our prayer book comes straight from Scripture? What percentage? 25, more than 25. 75. You're, you are cleaning house. You are cleaning house today. 70, about 75% of our book of common prayer comes straight from the Scriptures, right? And if you say, well, well, how is that possible? Well, if we read the Eucharistic prayers, that comes right out of the Scripture, doesn't it? 
the, the night that Jesus was handed over, right? That, that comes straight from Scripture. There's a whole section in the prayer book that comes straight from the Psalms. We have all of the Psalms contained in the prayer book. Right? Uh, we have the canticles. Uh, we, we sang a canticle together this morning, the, the Song of Mary. It comes straight from the Scriptures. Right? A, a little creative licensing with the, with the melody, but comes straight from Scripture. All of those are contained in the prayer book. And 75% of our prayer book comes straight from Scripture. So give yourself more credit when somebody says, oh, you Episcopalians don't know your Scripture. Say, yes, we do. Yes, we do. We know a lot of very important verses from Scripture. Okay. Now, every church that is in communion with us uh, in the Anglican Communion, and the Anglican Communion has 80 million members worldwide, uh, for the most part, each country has its own Anglican church, starting with the Church of England. That's our, that's our mother church. And each one of those churches has a book of common prayer. The Church of England uses officially a prayer book from 1662. Did you know that? 1662 is their official prayer book. Now, why is that? Well, because the English church is set up in a way that it requires an act of British Parliament to, to draft a new prayer book. And do you think it's easy to get British Parliament to come together to agree on anything at all, let alone a prayer book? Probably not. It's, pre it's pretty hard. So the 1662 edition is the, the official book that is used in the Church of England. Now, they do have supplemental materials. They have something called common worship. And common worship is probably a language that we're more used to. So if you, if you went to England and you went to church there... The words would be very similar, but that's not coming from their official prayer book. That's coming from their supplemental worship materials. Now, we also have supplemental worship materials called Enriching Our Worship. And Enriching Our Worship is designed to uh, allow for uh, broader language because language, language changes over time. And our most recent prayer book uh, is published in, 19, uh, in 1979. It's the 79 edition. Now, the rules of our church, the Episcopal Church, make for a minimum of six years to draft a new prayer book. But as Father Harry explained to us this morning, the chances of it happening within a six-year period, he, he said zero. I, I, I said very limited. He said zero, and I think he's, more, he's closer to being right than I am. It's, it's not terribly likely that it could be done in six years. It probably would take at a minimum 10 years from start to finish. And I'm part of a... a a group that is asked questions about, you know, we're thinking about this for next time. What do you think, you know? And there's a lot of people in that group who have a lot stronger opinions about things than I do. So I kind of, I kind of back away a little bit. Uh, I, I say, I speak up when there's something that I think is important, but uh, there, people get uh, pretty, pretty uh, emotional about things that are contained in the prayer book and about changing the prayer book. So it's a very delicate process and it probably isn't going to be changed for a while. Now, our 79 prayer book is based around the theology of one of those seven sacraments that we talked about. Does anyone know which of the sacraments our prayer book is designed to focus on? Uh, no, no, no. Who said baptism? Baptism. Ooh. Baptism. Our theology from our 79 prayer book is focused very heavily on baptism and our baptismal covenant. And you can flip through to, to look at our baptismal covenant, and you can see that there, there are a lot of things that we say we are going to try to do, right? And, and that is a covenant, which means that, that God, God has a piece of it, and we have a piece of it. And we share that covenant together with God and with one another. And one of the things that we take very seriously in our baptismal covenant is uh, that desire to respect the dignity of every human person. That comes right out of our baptismal covenant. So that informs what we do. Anytime we make a decision, we have to ask ourselves, is this in line with our baptismal covenant? Does this respect the dignity of every human person? And that's why the Episcopal Church uh, focuses on things like, uh, like uh, affirming people uh, wherever they are in their life's journey. Right? We affirm people for, uh, for all gender expressions and, and sexual identities and all races and all ages Right? We respect the dignity of every human person. And we have to be intentional about doing that because it's part of our covenant that we make with God. Okay? Every time we go to general convention or diocesan convention or, or even here at the vestry, 
When we make decisions, we need to ask ourselves, is this decision in line with our baptismal covenant? That's what our 79 prayer book uh, teaches us to do. And it's very important. Okay? Now, all the baptized Christians are official members of the Episcopal Church. Did you know that? Anyone who is baptized is an official member of the Episcopal Church. As long as you say you are, right? you don't have to identify as an Episcopalian, but as long as you say, I'm an Episcopalian, then you're in. That's how, that's how easy it is. The baptized are, are the official members of the Episcopal Church. And the sacraments are available to anyone who requests them. Now, notice I said requests. You have to request a sacrament. A sacrament can't be imposed upon you. you can't, I, I can't come up to you and, and shove a communion wafer down your throat. Right? You, have, you have to request to receive the sacrament of Eucharist. Right? And you might say, well, what about when a baby is baptized? Well, in, in that instance, then the parents and godparents are, are, are requesting baptism on behalf of the baby. Right? So, so it is being requested in that case. Okay. Now, there's, there's a lot of talk about the theology of Eucharist without baptism, because the official policy of the Episcopal Church is that all the baptized can receive communion. But there's a lot of talk about, well, what happens if someone receives communion who isn't baptized, and that practice of receiving communion uh, leads that person to experience the grace of the sacrament, and because of that grace, that person seeks baptism. That's a real thing. That, that, that really happens. I know people for whom that has happened. And uh, I'm one of the proponents of saying that everyone is welcome at the table. Because I don't believe my call as a priest it requires me to protect God from his people. Now, at best, if someone who is not baptized comes forward and receives communion, well, maybe that person uh, will decide, I'd like to be I'd like to be part of this. I'd like to be baptized. And so that's a, that's a good thing that can come about from it. But remember, we talked about sacraments have to be requested. And so if someone who comes forward and simply doesn't believe, well, then that person, you know, at worst is, is just consuming a piece of bread and a sip of wine. That's, that's my view on that, is that it's, it's, not, uh, it's not going to cause any harm, right? And, and it can only cause good. Now, fortunately, our culture here in this diocese is that our bishop backs me up on that kind of a decision. But not all bishops do. Not all bishops are okay with their clergy saying that. And that's something that uh, maybe the culture of the church will, will eventually shift toward and, and make that the, the official policy. Okay. So in summary here, what, what does it mean to be an Episcopalian? It means to be a Christian in context. Right? And this is our context here in Glendale. This is our context. This is, this is who we are. This is how we practice our faith because of our community. Right? We're, Christian, we're Christians in context. It means that we provide a radical welcome to everyone. It means that we welcome the stranger. We feed the hungry. Right? And in life, we try to do our best. And when we can't do our best, we try to work on getting better. That, that, that in, that's informed by our culture. Okay? And every parish is a little bit different. But all parishes are influenced by this larger culture of the Episcopal Church. And our culture, as, as we saw in the gospel today, is that Jesus calls us. When Jesus calls us, we want to discern the best way we can say yes. So going forward, as we continue our Lenten journey together and we, we move toward Easter, Let's continue to ask ourselves, where is God calling me today or calling us as a community? And what are the best ways that we can say yes? And when we discern how to say yes, let us continue to always seek ways to hear God's call and to say yes. Amen.